Our study this week is the fourth study of the series of studies that we have been taking a look at from the epistle to the Hebrews, where we have been going over the warnings that we find in the epistle to the Hebrews. The warnings are warnings about the pathway that leads to condemnation. As we saw, that pathway was laid out for us in our study last week. We're going to take a look at it again here in our study this week. We, In recent weeks, we have seen that the pathway towards condemnation that it begins with one choosing to neglect salvation. That is that when they choose to neglect the word of God, they choose to neglect God's gospel about his only begotten son. So in other words, the pathway towards condemnation, that is eternal condemnation, it begins with one choosing to neglect Christ. And we have seen that it continues with one, instead of turning around and, and trying to listen to, be open to the word of God, one will become hardened in their hearts. And so we saw the warning about hardening your heart. And, and then from there, the hardened heart, we know it can become stubborn and it is difficult for a stubborn person to listen. And that's what we covered in, in our study last week. Here in our study this week, we're going to again, literally pick up in the sixth chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews, where we're going to see the next warning and this next warning, it is grave. It is very grave. We have a lot that we need to cover here in our study this week. So I actually want to go ahead and get started into scripture. We're going to again cover the sixth chapter of the epistle of Hebrews. I'm going to focus in on scripture that runs from the first through the ninth verse. But again, I'm going to reference scripture uh, throughout this chapter as well. So I hope that you have your Bibles opened. And I hope that you are ready to join me here in our study for this week. So let's start off by taking a look at the first four verses here in our study this week. Well, we'll see there in the first verse that the writer writes, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. We'll take the second verse as well. The second verse says, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. So we'll see there that the writer, again, bringing back up what was discussed, what was brought up in the fifth chapter, where in the fifth chapter in our study last week, we saw where if one does not want to be dull of hearing, if one wants to, to turn around from the pathway that leads to condemnation and and began on the pathway towards righteousness. We saw where the writer brought up the fact that that person would need to be taught. They would need to learn the basic principles of Christ. They would need to, to learn those elementary principles of Christ, the, the foundation of faith. They would need that again. They would need to be attentive to that. They would need to learn it. They would need to know it. They would need to, to understand it if they desire to again attain righteousness if they desire to go on the pathway towards righteousness. And so with that thought in mind, as I said in, in last week's study, babies, they only drink milk for, for a short period of time before they need solid food to, to satisfy and to nourish them, right? They need that solid food in order to grow. And so, yes, the word of God is, is pure milk, as Peter said. But at some point in time, you can only hear that God gave the world his only begotten son to save the world. There is a whole lot more depth to the gospel. And so, as I said in our study last week, there's nothing wrong with, with learning the basic principles, the elementary principles. There's nothing wrong with, with learning the foundation of faith. But your faith, it must mature. It must continue to grow. And the reason why your faith must continue to mature, the reason why your faith must continue to grow is because your great adversary is always going to be trying to poke holes in your foundation. And so you must add on to that foundation. OK, so that's that's what we discussed in, in our study last week. And so the writer essentially brings that back up here within the first and the second verse that that it's time for us to move on from the basic principles to getting into the more complex matters, the more depth of the gospel there. 
Okay, so it said, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead. It's, it's as if the writer is saying, we, we've, we've discussed this before, we've discussed this again and again and again, but there is more for us to learn. And so it's time for us to mature, it's time for us to grow on from this point, and it's time for us to begin to learn something brand new something that will continue to, to increase in us so that we can grow in our knowledge, so that we can grow in our wisdom, so that we can grow in our understanding. Again, as we saw in our study last week, the writer wanted to, to teach the people about the great high priest that they had in Christ, but the people, they would not be able to understand it. And for them to be able to understand it, they needed to learn the principles, the basic principles first, so that they could move on to learning the more things that are complex about the gospel that they held true for, for those who are in that day of the writer. That's still something that holds true for all of us today as well. Now we'll see there in the third verse that the writer said, and this we will do if God permits, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy spirit. I'll take the fifth verse as well there and have tasted the good work of God and the powers of the age to come. The sixth verse, I'll take that as well. If they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves, the son of God and put him to an open shame. So there's a lot that is said there. But like I said, I'm not going to cover uh, right now, this very minute, the things that was essentially said there after the fourth verse, I, I again want to touch on essentially the basic principles. And then I want to move off of those basic principles because the writer starts to talk about something very deep there in, in the verses that we read towards the end of that passage that I was reading there. But again, like I said, last week I shared a chart that showed the pathway and I'm going to short share it with you here. Unfortunately for all you who may just be listening to the audio, you won't be able to see this, but if you go and look at the video, you will be able to see it. If you go to the website, you'll be able to see uh, this chart as well. There's a pathway that leads to righteousness. And I and I placed on that pathway the three levels of faith that I discussed in a study that I did a couple of years ago. And then again, there is a pathway that leads to condemnation. Again, this is something that I have already discussed in the opening here of our study. But we must be, again, aware of the steps that lead to condemnation. Because again, we, we have warning after warning that is essentially telling us to turn back from this pathway. This is again, this is going to be very important because this is going to come back up again here in our study. If you are one who is choosing to neglect the word of God, there is a warning there for you to not neglect the word of God. If you are one who is becoming stubborn in your heart to where you don't want anyone to even come up to you testifying of Christ or speaking about the gospel, there is a warning that is there for you as well. And if you have become so stubborn that you have just turned off God, you are dull of hearing, again, there is a warning that is there for you as well. What we have seen in our studies over the recent weeks is that the writer had a desire towards his people, the Jews, for them to heed the gospel. And so what comes from, from the word of God? What comes from, from heeding the gospel? Well, I would tell you that there is knowledge, right? There is knowledge. There is wisdom of, of who we are. Knowledge that we are sinners. Knowledge that we fall short of the glory of God. And, and in that knowledge, there is also power. Power being the fact that we know that we are sinners. Power being that we know that there is a way out of sin. Again, this that statement, again, is going to be very important. All right. You do not have to, to dwell in sin for the rest of your life. In fact, God does not want anybody to dwell in sin for the rest of their lives. Again, it is his will. That, that all people would heed his word, that they will keep his word, that they will be obedient to his word so that they can find life eternal with him, not life eternal separated, not life eternal apart from him. 
So God, he wants you to, to heed his word. He wants you to have an everlasting life of peace and of joy. He wants you to obtain salvation. Okay, keep that word in mind. What is salvation? Salvation is deliverance. So some of you may begin to wonder, well, deliverance from what? Salvation is deliverance from the world, the world being sin. Salvation is deliverance from the world. It is deliverance from sin. It is deliverance from the father of sins. You may ask, well, who is the father of sins? The father of sins is our great adversary, the one who first sinned. And for all of you who may be wondering, well, who's the one that first sinned? The one that first sinned is Satan. He sinned when he raised himself up thinking that he was higher than God, right? And when he raised himself up thinking that he was higher than God, he was cast out of heaven. And so since that point in time, the devil has done nothing but tempted mankind, okay, as he's tried to wage war against the Lord. Very important for us to know. And again, keep that in mind as we work our way through our study here for today. But again, as we have seen, the, the writer has a desire for his brother and his sisters, the Jews, not to dwell in sin. And so he's preaching to them Christ because Christ is able to deliver from sin. OK, we again know that his word is a saving word, right? Again, Jesus said that if my word is in you, if you abide by my word, it will set you free. And so that's what the writer desires. There were many who, again, had heeded the word of God and they were walking by faith. They were abiding by the word of God. But at the same time, there were a great deal more who had neglected salvation, who had hardened their hearts and who had become dull of hearing. And so the writer, again, is, is pitching Christ to those who were neglecting Christ because the writer did not want them to suffer in condemnation, did not want them to suffer the penalty of sin, right? And so that's what the writer is doing here. Again, he's sharing with the people the will of God. And for all of you who just want to verify what the will of God is, I'll quickly turn over uh, to the sixth chapter of John's gospel and we'll take a look at the 39th verse there in the sixth chapter of John's gospel so that you can see Jesus and what he said is the will of God. Let me get over there to the sixth chapter of John's gospel. And we'll take a look at what that 39th verse says there. Where in the sixth chapter and the 39th verse, you'll see it say, or this is Jesus speaking there. Jesus says, this is the will of the father who sent me that of all he has given me, I should not lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. So Jesus, he plainly tells us that the will of God is for again, all to be raised up at the last day. The will of God is that, that all be delivered, that all obtain salvation. But the question is, is will everyone obtain salvation? How does one obtain salvation? Well, the only way that anyone can obtain salvation is by faith. You can only obtain salvation by faith in Christ, the only begotten son of God. Again, let us remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus in the third chapter of John's gospel in the 16th verse. Jesus said, for God so loved the world, he gave the world his only begotten son, right? And then he said, Whoever believes in him, the only begotten son of God, will not perish, but will have everlasting life. That is the only way that anyone can obtain salvation. So since salvation is on the mind, since salvation has been promised, I want us to now take a look at the 17th through the 20th verse there in the 6th chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews. Well, we'll see there in the 17th verse where salvation is spoken of here. The promise, God's promise of salvation is at heart here in these verses. Well, we'll see there in the 17th verse, the scripture says there, thus 
God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it, the promise, by an oath. There in 18 verse says that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. Listen to this. Two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. We might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold on the hope set before us. The 19th verse says this hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Listen to these words. Okay. Again, like I said, in that chart that I showed you, there's a pathway towards righteousness. That pathway is a pathway of salvation that, that all of us, we should desire to be on that pathway. We should desire to be on the pathway uh, of salvation towards righteousness. But unfortunately, not all of us are on the pathway of salvation towards righteousness. But salvation, what we see mentioned there, again, there in the 17th verse, salvation, that's promise. It is promised to us. Again, like I said, referencing the third chapter of John's gospel in the 16th verse, we see the promise. Jesus tells us of the promise. Again, the promise is this. Whoever believes in him, the only begotten son of God, will not perish. Okay, Jesus was not hesitant about that statement. He was not hesitant about it at all. He said, if you believe in me, and we saw this in the sixth chapter of John's gospel as well, when Jesus said that, that he's the bread of life, said, if you, if you come to me, you won't hunger again. If you come to me, you won't thirst ever again, right? You, you will live, you will be sustained for life. And he wasn't talking about this physical life. He was talking about spiritual life. We know the promise. Okay. There is a promise of salvation. And that, that promise of salvation, that should be all of our hope. Okay. That, that should keep us encouraged. That should keep us uplifted. That is what should motivate us to continue to live each and every day of our life by faith so that we can again attain that holiness and that righteousness so that we can enter into the kingdom of God. That should, that's my hope. That is my hope. And, and I will hope for you that that is your hope. Now, the promise of salvation, it is so important to the Lord that the writer says here that the Lord has taken an oath there. Look at what it says there in the 17th verse. Again, to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it, his promise by an oath. Then the 18th verse says that that promise confirmed on that oath is by two immutable things. Okay. And so when we talk about immutable things, we're talking about something that, that is not bulging. It's not moving. It's not going anywhere. Okay, he said two immutable things. What are those two immutable things? Do you have any idea what the promise of salvation is essentially sealed by? Okay, if, if you do not know, let us again think about what Jesus said. Okay, Jesus is one of those immutable things, if you think about it, right? He said, whoever believes in me will not perish, but will have everlasting life, right? What did Jesus do for us so that we could have an opportunity to be able to, to attain that everlasting life? I believe all of us know, I believe that all of us know exactly what Jesus did, right? Jesus, the first thing that a believer would tell you about Jesus is that he died for our sins, that is, again, the elementary principles of, of our faith. That is the, the foundation of our faith, right? That Jesus, he died for our sins. He became our atonement offering, our propitiation. So that, again, that he shed his blood, okay, the, the blood of the lamb, he shed it to cover our sins so that, that we are covered by his blood, so that when, when the wrath of God comes upon sin, the wrath of God will pass over us. Huh? So, so again, Jesus, he died, but he did something else, right? He rose, right? 
He rose from the dead. He rose from, from the grave. And he said, all authority has been given to me. But Jesus, he did something else after that, that the death and his resurrection. He did something else. What else did he, what else did he do? Well, he hung around for a little bit, right? He, he, he hung around for about 40 days teaching the apostles, right? But then he did something else, right? So he, he Jesus, again, he is one of the immutable things. His death, his resurrection, and then he ascended. And his ascension is very important. Do you have any idea why it was important for, for Jesus to ascend? Why it was important for Jesus to go away? If you do not, let us turn over to the 16th chapter of John's gospel. And in the 16th chapter of John's gospel, I want you to go down to the seventh verse. And there in the seventh verse, we are going to see Jesus after telling the disciples about him needing to go away. OK, this comes on the heels of the 14th chapter where Jesus said that he was going away to prepare a place for us and that he would come again and receive us unto himself. The us there being the sincere believers. We will see there in the seventh verse, Jesus, he said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. OK, and, and I want you to understand that he wasn't talking about going over to another room, going off to a distant country. No, he was talking about his death, his passing away, and also talking about his resurrection and also talking about his ascension. He was talking about going back home, going back to that eternal realm. All right. And so he said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. The helper, Jesus was speaking of the Holy Spirit the comforter. Okay. And so he says that if I don't go away, if I don't return back to that eternal realm, if I don't go back to my father's house, then the helper, the Holy spirit will not come to you. And it is again, very important that the Holy spirit come. It was very important for, for us to receive the Holy spirit. Okay. And so we'll get into that in a second here. I just want to finish the scripture there. It says, but if I depart, I will send him to you. So again, Christ he needed to go away so that we can receive the Holy Spirit. Now, again, for us to understand the significance and the importance of the Holy Spirit, we must understand his role. We must understand the role that the Holy Spirit plays in, in our daily lives. And so for us to, to know for us to understand the role that he plays in our lives, we'll again take a look at what Jesus what he says there in the 13th verse, where there in the 13th verse, Jesus says, however, when he, the spirit of truth, that's still talking about the Holy Spirit, he says there, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. You've heard me say that several times about the Holy Spirit. OK, the Holy Spirit, he plays a role in guiding us into all truth. For he will not speak, Jesus said, on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Now, take a look at that 14th and that 15th verse. We're there in the 14th, there in the 15th verse. We see that Jesus said of the Holy Spirit, the role that he plays in our lives is that he will glorify me for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Okay. He will take of what is mine and declare it to you. 15 verse says, all things that the father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So what, what was it that was of Christ? Think about it again for a moment. Jesus again said that the Holy Spirit would glorify him. Okay. That the Holy Spirit will take of what is his and he will declare it to us. All right. What is it that was Jesus's? Right. Well, again, that promise, that, that promise of salvation, the promise of the father's house and the role that the Holy Spirit plays in our lives is to guide us into all truth. 
the truth of, of deliverance, the truth of, of salvation. Okay? He said, all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you, the heavenly kingdom. The Holy Spirit plays a role in our life to, to guide us to the heavenly kingdom. He guides us into all truth. He guides us down the path of righteousness, down the path of salvation. And so, again, we have a promise of salvation that, again, it was it is sealed to us in Christ, who then gave us the Holy Spirit, who is also another seal. So when we talk about the two immutable things there, going back to the sixth chapter of Hebrews in the 18th verse, let us understand that salvation has been confirmed to us first by Christ, the only begotten son of God, who told us about heaven, who said that he is the way, the truth and the life, that nobody can go to the father, but by him. He said that he is the way to heaven. If we want to get there, that we must follow him. Then when he left this world, because he wasn't going to be here forever. All right. Jesus, he died in the flesh and he rose again with all authority in his hands. And then he returned. He ascended. And so he did not leave us alone, did he? No, he gave us the helper, the Holy Spirit, who declares to us the same things that Christ declared to us. And so though we don't see Jesus in the flesh today, the Holy Spirit abides with all of those who are of sincere faith. The Holy Spirit, I want you to understand that he is again the sealer of the promise. He's the one that confirms the promise. And Jesus said that he needed to go away so that the helper could come. And the fact that, again, Peter received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was confirmation of Jesus being exactly who he said he was. The fact that you and I, that we still are able to receive the Holy Spirit today because of our faith, it again confirms that Jesus was exactly who he said he was. Again, it confirms that salvation is legitimate. Salvation is real. It confirms that heaven is legitimate. It confirms that heaven is real as well. So again, salvation, anybody can go down the pathway of salvation. Anybody can attain holiness and righteousness. But the only way that it can be attained by anybody is through faith. If you do not have faith in the only begotten son of God, you cannot obtain salvation. And that was what was so important for the writer of this epistle to the Hebrews. It was so important that he needed to, again, continue to tell his people to stop neglecting salvation, stop hardening their hearts, stop being dull of hearing, listen to the gospel and heed the gospel, be attentive to the gospel. It was important to that writer. It's still important to me. That's why I'm sharing this Bible study. I'm not sharing this Bible study necessarily to all of you who are already of sincere faith. I'm mostly sharing this Bible study in the hopes that one who desires, who desires that everlasting life with the Lord, but maybe they have, you know, maybe they stepped away from, from the faith for a little bit and maybe they're, they're coming back in. This study is for you. These warnings, they are for you as well. These warnings are for those who continue to believe that they don't need God, that they don't need the gospel in, in their lives. This study is for them as well. OK, it is, again, very important for us not to make light of salvation, which is, again, unfortunately, it happens. It happens a great deal in our world where salvation is mocked, it is scoffed, it is made light of, and therefore Jesus is scoffed mocked, made light of. God is scoffed at, mocked, and made light of. Okay? Salvation, you should desire salvation. You should not desire to go down that pathway of condemnation. Okay? Now, with that in mind, what I want to do here is I want to jump back up. I want to jump back up to the scripture that we began to read there from the fourth verse through the sixth verse, because this is where the meat of our study is found. Because in this passage of scripture, 
we find the warning. All right. This this scripture here is some of the most misunderstood. It, ra- it brings up a question that believers will actually ask that they should not have to ask at all. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. Let's read the verses first. We'll see there in the fourth verse that it says, For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Many people take this to be talking about believers falling away. Talking to believers falling away, falling into sin again, right? And so the writer says that it is impossible, right, for those who have fallen away to renew them again to repentance. A lot of a lot of people take this to mean that believers can lose salvation if they fall away, if they fall back into sin. And so the question is often raised, is it possible for those who have joined the church, those who have said that they believe in God, it is often asked, is it possible for them to lose salvation? And so this gets me into the conversation that we have been having recently between the professed believer and the sincere, the sincere believer, the one who sincerely walks by faith. And something that you have heard me say recently, and I believe I said this in last week's study, I know for a fact that I said this in a recent sermon. There is a difference between the professed believer and the believer that has confessed with their heart. Okay, the professed believer is the one that loves to say that they believe. They like to say that they are a Christian. They like to say that they are a child of God. But when you look at their actions, their actions does not speak about their faith. It does not speak about their professed, their professed faith. Their actions, in fact, betray their profession. Whereas the confessed believer, the one who's sincere in faith, they not only have confessed with their, their mouth, they confess with their heart. And I, again, I always get into the habit of beating on my chest when I say the heart, but I'm talking about confessing with, with the soul, okay? That is the difference the, the confessed believer is someone who sincerely and genuinely moves by faith. You can look at their actions and their, their actions are to uplift. Their actions are, are to love. They love with the love of God. Are they perfect? Absolutely not. I'm a confessed believer and I'll tell, and I say it all the time, and I know people think that I'm going to be crazy when I say it all the time, and when they hear a preacher or pastor say this, but I'm far from perfect, and I don't pretend to be perfect. I, I, I falter just as much as the next believer would falter. So is it possible for me to lose my salvation? Is it possible for you as a sincere believer to lose your salvation? What do you think? Now, if you if you just glance over the fourth through the sixth verse there, you would think that it is possible for you to lose your salvation. But again, we must remember the targeted audience that the writer of this epistle was trying to reach. The writer of this epistle was not trying to to reach the sincere believer. You see, the sincere believer, it is impossible for the sincere believer to lose salvation. We just went over this, right? Salvation is sealed. The sincere believer has received the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, again, is a sealer of our salvation. When you have received the Holy Spirit, you're not losing. You're not losing your salvation. Now, some will say, well, pastor, you just said that you fall into sin. You just said that you you still sin. All of us do. I want you to understand that nobody in this world is perfect. All of us, we still sin. But here's the kicker for the sincere believer. You should do as I do, because, again, you know the word of God. You know that you should go to God and that you should confess your wrongdoings to him. Now, if you don't know that, hey, let's turn over to to what it said in 1 John, the first epistle of John. And let's take a look at the first chapter of 1 John. And let's take a look at the ninth verse. When, When you get over there to 1 John 
Take a look at the first chapter of 1 John. Take a look at that ninth verse and see what it says there in that ninth verse. John was talking to the sincere believer here. And John said to the sincere believer, he said, if we confess our sins, he, the he there is talking about God. He said that he is faithful. He is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The sincere believer should never walk around believing for one second that God is not going to forgive them, that God is not going to show us mercy. We shouldn't think that way. The Lord, he is a merciful God and the Lord, he will forgive us. He will forgive us time and time and time again. Again, if you do not believe this, let's turn over to the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel. And when you get there in the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel, I'm not going to read all of this, but when you get to the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel, you can look at scripture that starts there in the 21st verse and it runs through the 35th verse. Now, there in the 21st verse, you'll see where Peter came to Jesus. And Peter, he came to Jesus and he said to Jesus, asking Jesus, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. That's, how, that's what tradition had taught. Seven was a good number. But look at what Jesus said to Peter there in the 22nd verse. Jesus said, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And then there, running from the 23rd verse throughout the rest of this chapter, we'll see where Jesus, he shares a parable of the unforgiving servant, where the master of the servant forgave this servant of, of his great debt. I mean, this servant, the, the, in the parable, you'll see if you go over this parable, this servant owed a lot of money. I'm talking about money that, that you could not even imagine. You would wonder, well, why did that man take out that much money? It would be like taking out hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, right? And the, the master of this servant forgave him of all of it. But then the servant turned around and couldn't forgive his brother who did him wrong, tried to act harshly towards his brother that did him wrong. And, and Jesus was teaching that lesson that, look, God, he forgives you, forgives us over and over and over and over again that we should forgive all of those that are around us, that we should forgive them over and over and over again. We should, again, love with the same kind of love that, that the Lord has for us. God, again, will show you mercy. He'll show you mercy all day long. But when you come to him and when you confess your wrongdoings to him, when you repent, okay, that's a very important word. We've gone over this in, in our studies all this season. When you repent, and you are sincere in your repentance, God is certainly going to work with you. And he will, he will again forgive you of your transgressions when you have earned that forgiveness. Again, turning over to the 17th chapter. Let's turn over to the 17th chapter of Luke's gospel. And when you get to the 17th chapter of Luke's gospel, just look at the uh, first through the fourth verse there in the 17th chapter of Luke's gospel where you'll see there that Jesus was once again teaching the disciples about forgiveness. And he was teaching the disciples to forgive in the same manner in which God forgives us, the sincere believers, those who come and make their confession known to him. You see there that, that Jesus said, I'm going to take the third verse where Jesus said, take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. Okay. Offer correction, let them know that they have done wrong, and then, then tell them how that they can correct the wrong that they have done to you. He said, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you, saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And again, the reason why Jesus taught forgiveness in this manner is because that's how God forgives us. The Lord, he again, he desires to forgive. He desires to, to forgive us, to, to take the weight of, of guilt off of our shoulders. But again, the question that, that we have to answer is whether or not we actually believe that he will forgive. And we have to ask, you know, ourselves whether or not we are actually going to him for that forgiveness. 
You know, there are, again, many believers that believe that that they can lose their salvation. They believe that, that God won't forgive them. Where I have just showed you scripture after scripture after scripture. The Bible is filled with examples and scripture just like this, where, where God will forgive. You just have to believe. You have to, to humble yourself and you have to go to him. The sincere believer should know better than thinking that God won't forgive them. Again, if you have been questioning whether or not you can lose your salvation because, hey, you, you went out and you committed a sin, I will tell you today, so long as you are of sincere faith and you have received the Holy Spirit, your salvation is signed, sealed, and delivered. And God is not one that plays takesy backsies. He's not a little kid. Your salvation, it has been sealed. So when we read the, the fourth through the sixth verse there, we should read it with a mindset that it is literally impossible for the sincere believer to lose salvation. Again, the writer said there, he said there, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God, okay, and the power of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance. They're not going to fall away. You're not going to fall away if you're of sincere faith. The writer said it's impossible for you to do that. And then some will say, oh, no, Pastor, maybe you're wrong on that because it says if they fall away. Now, if there is someone that is professing to be of faith, I would tell you today that if they fall away, I would say that they never had. They never gained salvation. The professed believer, they haven't confessed with their heart. And again, Paul said in the 10th chapter of Romans in the 9th and the 10th verse, if you look at that scripture, Paul said that the only ones who are saved are those who have confessed with the mouth, all right, believed in their heart. Those are the ones that are saved. Those are the ones that have received the Holy Spirit. Not the one that is simply going around and saying, hey, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. You've heard me say that before. You can go around all day long and say, I'm a Christian. But that does not mean you have salvation. It's all about the heart. What have you said in your soul? The fourth through the sixth verse, that is geared towards those who have not heeded the gospel. Those who have who have not heeded the gospel, they have not been enlightened. They have not tasted the heavenly gift. They have not tasted the good word of God. They don't know anything about the powers of the age to come because they have not received the good word. They will fall away. Those who have not heeded the gospel, they will fall to condemnation, as I've shown on the chart. They will not be renewed because they don't have the faith to be renewed. Again, the question that we have to answer, everyone has to answer, is again what I said in the sermon a couple of Sundays ago. Who do you say Jesus is? Do you know who he is? Do you believe in who he said he is? If you don't believe, then you will never gain the Holy Spirit. There is no sealing of salvation for you. The only thing that has been sealed for you is condemnation. Say it again. Again, they, they can't crucify Christ again. All right? They, 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 can't, they cannot attain that righteousness. So we, again, we must remember that salvation, salvation that is sealed for us. Let's, let's do some more Bible turning to, to show you where Paul spoke about how, again, our salvation is sealed. When we turn over to uh, his letter to the church in Rome, turn over to Romans, the eighth chapter of Romans, and just take a look at uh, the first verse there in the eighth chapter of Romans. And you'll see there in the first verse, there in the eighth chapter of Romans, Paul said, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Again, the spirit, when it abides in you, it is leading you to salvation. 
It is leading you to the kingdom of God. Just heed his voice. You are of sincere faith. You have received the Holy Spirit. Why would you dare ignore the Holy Spirit? He's leading you into all truth. In his letter to the church of Ephesus, let's turn over to Ephesians. And again, if you beat me there, I want you to take a look at the first chapter of Ephesians. I want you to take a look at the, the 13th verse there in Ephesians. And there you'll see the scripture. It says, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit, again, one of those immutable things. I'm just draining this. I'm doing my best to drain this in the hearts of all of you who are of sincere faith who are looking at this, who are listening to this today, you cannot lose your salvation. Okay? You cannot lose your salvation. And then again, back here in our study, there in the sixth chapter, if you look at the ninth verse, what does that ninth verse say there? The ninth verse says, But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation though we speak in this manner. That is certainly directed towards those who have heeded the gospel. The writer of this epistle, if it's Paul, he's certainly confident. And if it was not Paul, this person is certainly confident as well. And what is it that is giving them the confidence? Again, what we read there from the 17th through the 20th verse. Salvation is sealed on two immutable things. That is Christ and that is the Holy Spirit. God, he is no liar. Okay, God, he is faithful. Faithful is his nature. Okay, so again, we cannot lose salvation. The question now is, can the one that's headed down the pathway of condemnation, can they gain salvation? That, that is the question that that can now be asked. But again, let's read that fourth through the sixth verse again. We see there in the fourth verse, it says, it is impossible for those who are once enlightened to have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. So I understand that the fourth through the sixth verse can be, again, quite confusing. But to simplify what the writer is saying there in those verses is that for those who are partakers of the Holy Spirit, it is impossible for them to fall away. Now, some believe, again, that believers can lose their salvation. But I want you to understand that the sincere believer their salvation is sealed. The professed believer, that they don't have salvation. It's, it's nothing for them to lose, okay? So the question is, well, can the professed believer, can they gain salvation? The question is, can the sinner, can the sinner gain salvation? I would put both of them on the same level. And I'll bring back up the chart again for, for you who are watching for you to see. Now, if you're looking at the chart, you'll notice all the way to the left, that little cliff there, it says undecided. OK, I will put, you know, everyone starts out on that level. All right. Undecided. And then, you know, depending on the choices that you choose to make spiritually, you will take one of the two pathways. Hopefully you would take the pathway of growing in your faith, right? Maturing in your faith, then becoming stronger of faith. That would be the, the pathway that I hope that you, you would go on. The professed believer is one who's just really still standing on that cliff, okay? They, they're professing faith, but they aren't of faith. In fact, many professed believers will actually start going down the pathway towards condemnation, which is why, again, like I said, the, you know, the professed believer honestly ain't no different than the sinner. All right. So, again, just continue to look at that chart there. 
the sinner, I want you to understand there's a difference between the sinner and the one who's convicted of sin. There are many living in our world today that are convicted sinners. They indulge in sin and for them, there is absolutely no turning back. They are already down on that bottom floor of eternal condemnation looking at that chart. Okay, they, they are already down there and there's no coming back for them. But for those who are going down those levels, right, neglecting salvation, they, their hearts may be, you know, starting to harden. Maybe they're becoming, you know, hard of hearing, not listening. And maybe they're starting to start, starting to fall away, starting to drift away, right? But they, they haven't hit rock bottom to where there is no coming back for them. So if you're on those steps, there's, like I said last week, there's an, an opportunity to go back up the steps. We have to understand that, that when Christ came to the world, he was speaking to, to all of the world because the world was going down those steps. And Christ, the objective of Christ was to bring us out of those steps and start us back up the other, the other way, going back up the steps toward the, to, towards righteousness. So, can those who have neglected salvation, right, those who are on that first step, can those who have ne neglected salvation, can they come back up or must they keep going down the pathway of condemnation? They don't have to keep going down that pathway of condemnation. They can easily turn around and go up the pathway to righteousness. That's just like those who have a hardened heart. Do they have to keep going down the pathway of condemnation? No. They can easily turn around and, and yes, profess faith, but then confess faith and receive the Holy Spirit. The same holds true for those who are dull of hearing. This is why the writer wrote this epistle. To get those who were neglecting salvation to turn back around. To get those who were starting to harden their hearts to 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 turn back around, to get those who are becoming dull of hearing to turn back around, to get those who are starting to fall away, to get them to, to turn back around. The writer did not want anyone to get too deep to where they would not be able to get back up out of that hole. So again, is it possible for, for one who had neglected salvation for one who's on the pathway of condemnation, is it possible for them to, to turn back around and then receive the Holy Spirit and therefore have their salvation sealed? Absolutely. That is what God wants. We went over the will of God, right? That is exactly, that is absolutely what the Lord, the Lord desires. He wants repentance. That is exactly what repentance is turning back around, getting on the pathway of righteousness. Each and every day for us is another opportunity. Okay? For, for those who are on the pathway of condemnation, it is an opportunity to get off of that path. And for those of us who are on the pathway of righteousness, it's another opportunity for us to continue to grow and to mature in our faith. And like I said, no believer should be thinking for one second that they could lose salvation. If you have been thinking that, you have a lot of studying to do. There's still a lot of growing and maturing for you to do. It's time for you to leave the, the elementary principles and start going into depth in the word of God. Okay? So, let, again, let us again... Take a look there at the 7th through the ninth verse as we can start to come to a close. I think I've hit on this enough, okay? It is certainly, again, possible for, for you to turn around if you're already on that pathway of condemnation. But I want to take a look here at what is said there in the 7th through the ninth verse, where there in the 7th through the ninth verse, the writer said, for the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. 
Now, those verses, they won't seem to make much sense to, to us, you know, who may not be familiar with Scripture. It may, in fact, seem like it comes out of left field for all of us who may be familiar with Scripture there. What is the writer talking about here, right? Why did the writer all of a sudden turn to the earth, which drinks in the rain? OK, there's there's a specific purpose. There's something that is in mind here that the writer is talking about. There's a couple of things, in fact, that we can break down, that we can gather in here uh, from this scripture. Let's take a look at what is said there and let's go over it. it says there again, looking at that same verse it says for the earth, which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessings from or receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Now, I will point out to you again that there are a couple of things that's in mind here to where first we can see the the two pathways, right? There are two pathways here, two outcomes here that's mentioned, right? It rains on the earth and it can be a blessing because it can bear herbs that can be cultivated, right? Herbs that, that can be cultivated for, for nourishing us, those who, who consume all right, what, what, what grows from the earth, right? That is at least good for us to be able to consume. That's good for us to be able to eat. But then there's a flip side. There's an opposite, that there could be thorns and briars that nobody's going to eat the thorns. Nobody's going to eat the briars. We don't even want through, want to walk through, through briars and thorns, right? Whose end again is to be burned. There are two pathways that we've been discussing all of this study, right? The pathway that leads to righteousness, the pathway that leads to condemnation. Which do you think is being represented by which? in those two verses there in the seventh and the eighth verse. I think it is very clear. I think it is very obvious, right? Now, what this verse, I also want to point out that it focuses in on here is how we have been talking about the goal and the desire of the writer here, where the writer here has desire for the people to do what? The writer has desire for the people to heed the good news of the gospel. The writer is desire for the people to heed the word of God, because if they heed the word of God, they will be blessed. They, they will find life as expressed there in the seventh verse. OK, so also here in the seventh and eighth verse, the word of God is also in mind here. It reminds me of scripture that you can find over in the 55th chapter of Isaiah in the 10th and the 11th verse that I want us to turn over to. They're in the 55th chapter of Isaiah. We will see there in the 10th and the 11th verse. Scripture that reads and says, For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, that again, that sounds very familiar, different wording, but it is very familiar to what we read over in the epistle to the Hebrews. Then there in 11 verses says, so shall my word be that goes from my mouth. These are words from God through the prophet Isaiah. OK, so shall my word. Who is God's word? The only begotten son, right? Remember what it says there in the first chapter of John's gospel in the first verse? So shall my word be that goes from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It shall not return to me empty, is what the Lord says there. But it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God, he sent his word, his only begotten son, for what reason and for who? Well, he sent his only begotten son for us, right? And for the reason that we will be saved, right? So again, those who have received the word will prosper. 
All right, we are we are going to be blessed. When you live by the word of God, I said in the series of sermons that I preached last week, last season or last year, I should say, that there's a tiny seed, the word of God, that when it is planted in us, it grows in us. And as that that seed grows, we we grow into a righteous tree of God. And and from that righteous tree, we are able to bear fruit that is holy, fruit that is righteous. But there are many other surfaces in this world, three other surfaces that that was discovered, that was discussed in in the parable of the sword that you can find over in the 13th chapter of Matthew's gospel, where some ground is like the wayside, some again, is stony places, and some is like thorny ground. And the word of God is not able to prosper in those places because they are unable to receive the word of God. And those places are, again, representative of people who have neglected the word of God, those who have neglected salvation. And so on those surfaces, can nothing grow? Can nothing prosper? All right. And so, again, when we get back over to to Hebrews, the, the sixth chapter of Hebrews, we will see there in, in that scripture where, again, the writer said, if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. I feel like that statement, it is, again, very fascinating because, one, it still opens up the doors for, for those who are going down the pathway of condemnation to still turn back. You don't have to to bear thorns and briars. But if you are fine with that, the writer makes it very clear. Your end is to be burned. He's talking about being cast into that everlasting fire. And I always feel I have to express this. That uh, that everlasting fire is not a literal fire. It's not a physical fire. It is being cast into outer darkness. That's why I have that chart where eternal condemnation is, it's darkness. So if you can see that darkness, if you're not in that darkness yet, the writer is saying, turn back, come back to the light, right? That's what the writer is, again, expressing. You do not have to fall away from salvation. That is what the writer has expressed in in our study this week. But in the studies that we have seen in recent weeks, again, the writer has a desire here that no one fall away from salvation, that no one be consumed with that everlasting fire. Okay, and so that's something, again, that all of us as believers, that's something that all of us, we should desire today for no one to be lost. God, again, does not want anyone to be lost. That is his will, that nobody be lost. Okay. And so, again, we have warnings here that we have gone over now for four weeks that are helpful warnings that we should share with those who have neglected salvation, those who have not heeded the word of God. Again, God's word, I want you to understand that it is a saving word. It is a saving word for all of those who are open to receiving. Okay, but at the same time, for those who who don't want to receive it, we see today that it can also be a condemning word. We shouldn't use it to condemn anyone, okay? I want to be very clear on that. I don't want anyone going out there saying, Pastor said I need to condemn you because I didn't say that. The only one who is going to condemn is is the Lord. God has the final say, okay? So again, keep these things in mind, all right? Keep these things in mind. And again, I hope that you have enjoyed this study. This study was one of great depth, okay? Very great depth. That again, I hope that you enjoyed it. Hope that you understand it. All right. And if you haven't understood it, there is a commentary that you can find over at newfoundfaith.org. I have the link to it in the description of the YouTube page below. And again, if you're listening to the audio, just head over to Newfound Faith, click on the Bible study tab, and you will see uh, this study. So again, I hope that you enjoyed this study. I hope that you'll come back for the fifth warning. All right. We are almost done with the warnings, but I certainly again hope that you will come back take part in our study next week and then come back for the last of the warnings as well.
haven't done so already, make sure that you're following here on YouTube so that you don't miss a Bible study, so that you don't miss a sermon, Sunday school lesson, or a food for thought. Take a moment, follow today.